So the time period after World War II is going to be marked by anti-communism and this second Red Scare and a lot of politics and just the general public is going to be concerned with communism and Soviet influence. Something else that's going to be uh, prominent in politics following World War II is going to be the emergence of this civil rights movement. Beginning after World War II and continuing especially in the late 1950s, uh, 1960s, we're going to see this push to uh, expand civil rights and reform civil rights and po politics to make it to where it is more accessible to minority groups, particularly African Americans. So we talked about in the Reconstruction Lecture the situation for African Americans in the South. As we mentioned, the Civil War meant the 13th, uh, end of the Civil War meant the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment being passed. Again, the 13th Amendment made it slavery illegal except for as punishment as a crime. 14th Amendment says equal protection under the law. You can't pass laws uh, based on a person's race. So if you're going to have a curfew, you can have a curfew, but you can't have it specifically towards African Americans. Um, again, it'll do things like uh, prevent those black codes as we talked about. And if you provide uh, public schooling, you can't exclude people from the benefits of public schooling based on race. And then, as we mentioned, the 15th Amendment says you cannot take away the right to vote based on race, uh, color, or previous servitude. Well, as we mentioned, following Reconstruction, we saw white Southern Democrats get back in charge of the South, and they put in place measures that didn't get rid of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, but because you can't do that, that's in the Constitution. But what they did do is they sort of got, found loopholes and got around uh, the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment. Now, the 13th Amendment, we're going to see a lot of African Americans imprisoned uh, that had not committed crimes. It's going to be a substantially higher percentage than you'd see of the white population imprisoned for uh, false charges. Uh, 14th Amendment, uh, again, you, if you're providing public schooling, if you're providing government services, you have to provide them to everybody you can't exclude based on race well what we'd seen in the south is white southern democrats that said okay we're providing public schooling but we're segregating so we'll have a black school over here white school over here and there had been a supreme court ruling saying this is okay as long as you're providing equal facilities so you can it's not a violation of the 14th amendment if you have a black school and white school as long as they're given equal treatment well in reality we're never going to see separate but equal be equal uh, because Supreme Court can't go around checking to make sure every school, every courthouse that's uh, set up for blacks is equal to whites. So inevitably, almost all black schools are going to be inferior to white schools, things like that. So 14th Amendment's on the book, but in reality, uh, Southern governments had found a way to get, get around that. And then the 15th Amendment says you can't take away the right to vote based on race, color, previous servitude. Well, we'd seen uh, white Southern Democrats get around that by putting in place poll taxes, literacy tests, things like that, that are going to affect uh, blacks disproportionately to whites. Again, the Constitution, the 15th Amendment doesn't say anything about taking away the right to vote based on who can read or not. So if you say you have to be able to pass this literacy test, um, then you're going to have a higher percentage of African Americans can't pass that literacy test. And that percentage isn't going to go up substantially because, as we mentioned, uh, if you have segregated schools, black schools refer receiving uh, inferior um, teachers, things like that, then you're going to continue to have this gap. Uh, and then if you have uh, de jure and de facto racism, if you have a poll tax and say you have to pay to vote, then uh, we'll see that African Americans are going to be able to close this economic gap. So this is going to mean a significant portion of Southern blacks will not be able to vote from uh, Reconstruction until this time period we're about to talk about. So again, during Reconstruction, substantial measures had been put on the books. These three important amendments have been put in place. But white Southern Democrats, when they got in charge uh, after Reconstruction, are going to find ways around this. And as we mentioned, uh, you had African-Americans in the South 
being disenfranchised, and essentially uh, the vast majority are going to be uh, destined for life of manual labor with a little chance of social or, or economic uh, mobility. Now, this changes somewhat in the early 1910s, as we mentioned, uh, during World War I especially. A lot of white workers had left to go off to war. Uh, we saw these in industries here in the north start appealing to African Americans in the south to move to these uh, big cities, not just in the north. You see uh, a lot of blacks move to places like California, things like that. So we see a substantial increase in the black population in, north, in the north uh, during this great migration. And this starts in the 19-teens. It's going to continue throughout the 1900s, especially to the 1970s. Uh, we'll talk about later why it starts, starts to slow down then. But you have these pockets in urban areas in the north uh, where you have African Americans. Now, again, the situation there, it's going to be better than what you would see in the south, but it's it's uh, not going to be out without hardships. Again, uh, African Americans are going to receive... Uh, uh, less pay on average than white workers. So it's not like things in the North are uh, perfect either. So again, you had the measures of reconstruction, but it, it hadn't guaranteed the freedoms that a lot of people who had drafted those measures during reconstruction hoped to uh, uh, hope the measures would uh, enact. So what's going to change that will start seeing African Americans be able to vote? Uh, see greater economic mobility, see higher percentage of African Americans receive an education. Well, a lot of these changes are going to come about after World War II, uh, and a lot of it's going to come about directly because of World War II. Some of it's going to sort of come as a side byproduct of World War II. One of the things that's going to come about is going to owe to this economic boom that's going to happen in the United States after World War II. As we mentioned, a lot of people are going to be coming home from the war, have expendable capital, the economy had gotten back on its feet, people have more money to spend as these factories had reopened during the war, they're going to stay open, start selling cars, you know, homes are going to start being sold. And one of the things that's going to be sold to these Americans with expendable capital again is the television. We're going to see a lot of American homes, a lot of people start watching TV more than they had uh, any time before. Well, this is going to be a big deal because it's going to expose a lot of white Americans to blacks for the first time. So if you are white and you live in the South, you've seen blacks. They're, they're you know, substantial po population of the South, um, even after the Great Migration, uh, a, a large population here. But if you're in the north, unless you live in a city or near a city, you probably don't have that much exposure to black people. You probably, maybe a black family down the street or something, or maybe you have the one, two black families at your school, uh, but you don't have that much exposure. Well, that's going to start to change with the television. What we'll see post-World War II is a lot more white Americans, particularly white Americans in the north and these western states, these places outside of the south, will start to see black people be exposed to black people for the first time. This is going to happen in the form of entertainment. You'll see uh, black actors start to appear on television, uh, and you'll uh, see black athletes start to participate in sports. Uh, we talked about baseball, how baseball becomes this major uh, sport, the major sport in the United States in the 1920s. People with expendable capital in the 1920s start attending ball games, start listening on the radio. Well, baseball had actually initially been integrated, uh, but then it started to be segregated uh, in actually the, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, and you'd had Babe Ruth never competed against black players. You actually had this segregated Negro League where the black players uh, would, would play against one another. Well, in 1947, and this is going to come about owing to this change in World War II that we're going to talk about, um, you see Major League Baseball, and this is the dominant baseball league at the time. If you are the best players, you're going to go to Major League Baseball. This is where they pay the most decided to integrate and bring on a player from the Negro Leagues, a guy named Jackie Robinson. This is just one example. I'm using Jackie Robinson as an example, but he is probably the major example of an African-American that will be exposed to white audiences. Uh, Jackie Robinson grew up in um, a Georgia, family of sharecroppers like most African-Americans in the South. Uh, didn't have much uh, chance of getting out of this sharecropping life. Well, he is going to uh, start playing baseball. He's going to 
proved to be exceptionally talented at this. Um, in part, you know, it's just he's a uh, hard worker. In part, you know, it's because um, his family had this emphasis on athletics. Uh, his brother was uh, in track, and his brother had gotten a silver medal in the 1936 Olympics. Um, Jackie, uh, 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 Jackie Robinson himself was also into track, but his favorite game was baseball. Well, 1947, uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers are going to decide to bring in this player, Jackie Robinson. There's going to be some controversy over this at the time, but as we'll talk about, post-World War II is this time of uh, change. A lot of people have been exposed to African Americans during the war, and uh, he's going to decide to introduce this black player. Well, Jackie Robinson is going to perform exceptionally. Um, for the uh, 1947 year, his rookie year, he's going to, I don't have the exact numbers here, but I think he's like a 370 or something uh, batting average, uh, and he's going to end up winning rookie of the year. Um, as a matter of fact, he performs so well, there's a poll in the United States uh, of who's the most popular uh, a man in the United States, Jackie Robinson. Uh, becomes it comes in second place, and it's just based on hey, this guy who's so does so well at baseball, and a lot of Americans again, first time they've been exposed to African Americans outside of again casual exposure um, when you go into town or something like that. Again, Jackie Robinson himself isn't you know alone doing this. So you're going to see other uh, prominent African Americans in cinema. Uh, and then once Jackie Robinson starts getting into sports, other African Americans will get into sports, and this is going to start exposing a, uh, a a lot of white Americans to the contribution of blacks outside of, um, uh, whereas again they hadn't had a lot of exposure before. Okay, all right. What else is going to ch cause this shift in attitude outside of the South post World War II? Well, a lot is going to be World War II itself. So. Uh, since the American Revolution, uh, up until after World War II, you're going to have a segregated military. So you're going to have um, uh, army will have black units and it'll have white units. Now the black units would sometimes have white officers, uh, most of the time have white officers, but they would go off and they would carry out their mission here. White units would carry out their mission here. And this is going to be the only group that's going to be segregated. Asians, Latinos are all in the, the white units, but uh, blacks had been segregating these units. And even though there was push to end segregation during Reconstruction, that went to the wayside and segregation remained post-World uh, War II in the military. Well, what happens in World War II is, you know, even though you have these segregated units, a lot of whites fought beside black units. And again, these are going to be a lot of white people who had never been exposed to blacks or very little exposure to blacks. And they're going to see, hey, these guys are performing just as heroically, as admirably as me. And a lot of people who, you know, had a very little exposure to blacks now are going to say, well, what's going on with them? You know, why are they segregated? This doesn't make any sense that they're doing the same things we can do, uh, but they're in a very different unit. And as a matter of fact, there's going to be a lot of talk during the war about integrating these units. As a matter of fact, in uh, 1945, there'll be a poll of officers who headed black units, as, as well as non-commissioned officers who uh, uh, worked with black soldiers. And they're going to say, what do you think uh, about the idea of uh, integrating the army? And they're going to particularly ask, you know, how did black soldiers perform in combat? Well, 95% of white officers, 96% of enlisted uh, soldiers who serve with black units said th they're just the same as white soldiers. They can perform just as admirably, just as heroically. This is ridiculous. Getting 95% of people to agree on anything is really tough, you know, but you're going to have white soldiers who serve with blacks. 95% will say uh, they're serving just, just as well as us. Uh, and you'll get a lot of famous black units during World War II. You, you'll hear uh, about the Tuskegee Airmen, these, um, uh, uh, these uh, fighter pilots that uh, would escort bombers into Nazi Germany. Uh, they performed exceptionally admirably protected white bomber pilot uh, crews from, from Nazi aircraft. And a lot of these white soldiers are going to then be returning home, and they're going to start to learn about the situation in the South. And this is one of these things that's important, is that in the North and West, 
A lot of people aren't familiar with the segregationist policies in the South. They'd heard about them, maybe read a little about them in the history books, but they didn't know the extent of them. Well, now you're hearing from these white soldiers serving with black soldiers in World War II, these tales of, hey, we can't eat in a restaurant or we got to eat in the kitchen. Hey, our school is different than the white school, doesn't receive as much funding. Hey, um, uh, there's very few colleges for blacks to attend in the South. Hey, you know, if we, uh, you know, start to achieve something, very good chance that, um, you know, uh, destruction of our property and the people who perpetrate this aren't going to be uh, punished. So World War II will expose a lot of whites to the plight of blacks in the South. Another thing that's going to happen is it's going to expo expose a lot of blacks to experiences overseas, okay? So a lot of times you would have these black soldiers set off in their segregated units, go to, say, uh, Britain, and they go to Britain and they walk into a pub, or they sort of hesitate to walk into a pub because they're used to uh, going to like a bar or restaurant in the South, not being allowed in. But then you'd have this British pub owner say, well, come on in here. What, what are you doing waiting outside? Of course you can come in here and serve here. You're a human being. And they'll come in. They'll be treated just as equally as whites uh, because in Britain there hadn't been segregation that you'd seen in the South. Again, a lot of uh, uh, poor blacks in the South never been more than a couple miles outside of their, their birthplace. Now you're shipped off as part of this war. You're drafting the army, and you're going to be exposed to places where segregation doesn't exist. Same thing. Maybe you go to Italy, uh, and then you're uh, fighting in Italy. You go to a restaurant. You're served just right, right alongside of white soldiers. You're entitled to the same privileges over there. And not only that, you're going to be exposed to propaganda from your own country saying that what the Nazis are doing to the Jews in Germany is wrong. And they'll do this propaganda showing how you know, Nazi treatment of Jews, making them live in segregated areas, uh, you know, uh, the Star of David forcing them to wear that on clothing. And there'll be this propaganda making fun of Germany for doing this type of thing. Well, you get a lot of black soldiers saying, wait a minute, you're saying that's wrong. That's exactly what's happening to us in the South. We're being treated differently uh, than other people. So you'll see this propaganda aimed at Germany. Uh, a lot of people will take it and say, hey, that's exactly what's happened to us. So this experience of World War II will enlighten a lot of black soldiers that didn't have exposure to anything outside of where they lived to how uh, things are done in the rest of the world. Uh, not only that, but World War II is going to allow a lot of black soldiers to receive an education. Now, uh, at the end or during Reconstruction, we saw a number of black schools be built uh, by the federal government, uh, some privately funded. And a lot of these schools had closed at the end of Reconstruction. Freedmen's Bureau gets shut down. They, they lose funding. But a handful had stayed open. And you saw this small black elite would attend these various schools and receive an education. But this was a tiny percentage of the black population because, again, owing to economic social conditions in the South, very hard for blacks to receive uh, higher education. Well, what happens at the end of World War II, and this is going to be something passed by um, – uh, FDR, and then it's going to be carried out by Harry Truman, is a bill will be passed called the GI Bill. What the GI Bill does is it's going to offer to pay for tuition and books for those who serve in the military. It's, it's a measure of thanks for soldiers. You can also kind of see it as a Cold War measure. Uh, basically, the idea is that if we have an educated population, then, you know, whenever we start fighting the Soviets, which they can already see towards the end of World War II. Uh, this means we have more scientists, more people to develop technologies that are going to make us more effective in battle. So this GI Bill was passed, and when servicemen get out of the war in World War II, they're going to now have money to attend college. Well, obviously, there's a 14th Amendment says you can't pass a law and just make it exclusive to one group or another. You can't just say only whites are entitled to the GI Bill. Although, as we'll see, some Southerners will make that argument that only whites should be entitled to the GI Bill. So what you're, you're going to have is a number of black soldiers now have the money and opportunity to attend college. And this is going to lead to a uh, an increase in education in the black community. So, and again, white community as well. The GI Bill is going to have a lot of long-lasting uh, effects, basically a lot of uh, 
poor white Southerners, poor blacks will have an opportunity for an education that they wouldn't have had before. All right, so World War II will do this change in white culture, black culture, and provide an education to blacks in ways that uh, were impossible before. At the same time, we're going to see post-World War II, and you can go on and say, go back to the 1930s, maybe even a little bit earlier than that. Another thing that's going to bring about this civil rights movement is going to be this political shift, okay? So what started happening uh, during, especially FDR, is that Democrats started to st step their toe into social reform. So we've been talking about this party politics for a long time. So basically the end of Reconstruction, initially Democrats were the party of small government. And, you know, a lot of that was in response to Reconstruction, didn't like how Republicans had come down, taken over state governments, thought they were going too far, taxing too much, trying to do too much reform at the national level. And then um, uh, their response was, if this is what happened in Reconstruction, then small government's the answer. Well, things had turned poorly for uh, a white Southerners. Farmers continue to do bad. Uh, and then, as we mentioned, a lot of farmers in debt. So we saw these populists emerge and talk about using government as an agent of economic reform to help the little guy. Uh, Democrats and populists emerged in 1896. And the Democrats had become this party of economic reform. But they'd shied away from social issues because white Southern Democrats, they did not like the idea that the national government could start getting involved in social issues again because last time they had done that uh, was during Reconstruction and, and uh, the national government had pushed for these reforms for blacks. So there was this, uh, uh, Democrats were part of economic reform, uh, in the, but they stayed away from social reform. That is until FDR. Now FDR started to do things like Social Security Act. The government should be there to help those who can't take care of themselves. Uh, his wife had started to talk about things like uh, ending segregation in certain areas. His wife had started to talk about, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt talked about anti-lynching laws. FDR had been quiet on that front for the most part because he didn't want to upset his party base in the South. But you started to see a number of Democrats seeing FDR's, you know, push towards social reform and these democrats are going to start to say maybe we should take the cause of social reform and you're going to see begin emerging in the 1930s a group you would call new deal democrats these new deal democrats were all about the economic reform again we're, we're helping the little guy through the government but they want to go further than that and they started to talk more and more about social reform look what fdr is doing Maybe the national government can be an institute of social change as well as economic change. Now, as we're going to discuss, white Southern Democrats almost all said, let's stay away from the social stuff. They love the uh, economic uh, uh, reforms because, again, a lot of number of uh, white Southern Democrats are poor and they benefit from the economic reforms. But again, there's this legacy of staying away from social reform since Reconstruction, so they don't like that. So you start to see this party crisis emerge in the 1930s, and it's going to continue after World War II, where some Democrats want to expand on social reforms. Some want to stay away from social reforms, particularly white Southern Democrats. But these Democrats outside of the South are New Deal Democrats that start talking about social reform. And some are either gonna, even going to... Uh, start talking about civil rights reform. For example, a Minnesota senator named Hubert Humphrey, uh, right after World War II, was going to call on getting the government to help the little guy, uh, meaning blacks in the South. He's going to say, it's time to get out of the sh shadow of states' rights and to stand in the light of human rights. So it's time for the national government, in spite of the fact that part of our party is dead set on uh, maintaining status quo in the South, the rest of us should step up and pass some social reform legislation in the South. So you started to see this break in this party emerge in the 1930s, and it's going to continue until the 1940s. Again, most white Southern Democrats aren't going to immediately leave the party uh, because a lot of them just don't like the idea of voting for a Republican. There's still a lot of animosity even, you know, 80 years later, or, uh, yeah, 80 years later uh, after Reconstruction. Um, and they wouldn't imagine voting Republican, but a lot of them are going to start to say, you know, 
uh, uh, a lot of white Southern Democrats, I don't like what's happening in this other branch of the party. And so you're going to start to see this change in attitude uh, among the Democrats. Um, Truman, you could say, himself was a New Deal Democrat. As we mentioned, uh, in 1948, uh, as part of the National Security Act, he's going to integrate the Army. Again, based on these uh, uh, polls he'd heard from white officers and and, uh, white uh, non-commissioned officers, they say segregation is pointless. It's stupid. It's a waste of money. Uh, And so Truman integrates the Army per executive order in 1948. Uh, and then the National Security Act will um, um, put that into law. Uh, and also you can say that's almost an anti-communism measure because one of the things that Soviet Union uh, builds on is class struggle. You know, hey, and uh, as we'll see, you know, they'll target racial issues as well. So we don't want the national government segregating because the Soviets can look at that and say, look, they're, uh, uh, you know, they look at what they're doing. They're stepping on, on uh, their lowest citizens. So... You'll see that uh, a Truman, New Deal Democrat, but also anti-communist measure, uh, will integrate the army. Okay, all right. So you start to see some Democrats say we need to change the party and we need to address these social issues. Well, all of these things together will lead to a an emergence in the black community for uh, in politics. You're going to see groups formed throughout uh, the north in these pockets and big cities predominant, uh, predominantly in places where there's uh, not disenfranchisement, at least not to the level of the south, you'll start to see these organizations start to merge. Like uh, here, this is a picture of this Omaha Urban League. This would be an example of a black organizi- organized group to start talking about political reform for blacks, particularly to address civil rights reforms in the south, but also address uh, political issues for blacks in the north as well. All right, so uh, that's going to lead to an increased uh, political participation in, in uh, these political groups. And also you're going to see a lot of black soldiers coming home with expendable capital from World War II. You know, you're paid for three, four years of service. You come home with money. Why don't I put some of this money towards membership in this NAACP, uh, National Associ- Association for the Advancement of Colored People? Uh, as a matter of fact... Um, Post-World War II, a lot of soldiers returning home with money to, to enter membership in the NAACP, um, you know, having seen the propaganda, uh, having been exposed to non-segregated communities. Uh, the NAACP membership will rise uh, uh, significantly. I think it, I don't have the exact number, I think it quadruples uh, in, from 1945 to 1950, uh, getting up to over half a million uh, uh, or 600,000 uh, in by 1946, and then it's going to increase further after that. So you start to see increased membership in, in these black political organizations. All right, so this is going to start bringing about this movement towards social change. But the main thing that's going to start actually causing this social change and is going to be something that will start happening in the United States court system. So the way things get done in the United States is multifold. I mean, you can have laws passed at the state or local level, but if you're talking the national government level, the main way you have political reform is legislative branch passes a law, the president uh, signs the uh, bill or law into law, and then um, he executes it, carries this out. Well, um, uh, as we're going to talk about, there's going to be some hesitancy to pass laws, especially because Democratic Party is going to be divided between these New Deal Democrats and these old school Democrats. Uh, so you're not going to see a lot of legal reform, at least not from the legislative executive branch uh, post-World War II, at least not for a while. But what you will see is that post-World War II, we're going to start to have this very active Supreme Court and judicial branch. What we're going to have after World War II is a Supreme Court that's going to be dominated by New Deal Democrats. So think about this. Uh, the last time a Republican, and Republicans had, had been this small or this uh, pro business party, generally smaller government and other things. They dropped the progressive part of their party uh, with uh, Teddy Roosevelt way back when. So it's generally small government uh, pro business. But the thing that 
is uh, the case with the, the Supreme Court. In 1932, or ni- beginning 1933, Hoover leaves office from 1932 until 1945, and then continuing on that until 1952 under Truman, you're going to have FDR and Truman in office. So you're going to basically have 20 years of Democrats. So you're not going to have Republicans adding to the Supreme Court. What this means is that Democrats are going to put people on the court that think like them, and FDR is going to put people in on the Supreme Court that believe in bigger government and believe in his allowing the national government to have economic reform. And he's going to put these guys on the Supreme Court that are actually open to the idea of national government uh, with social reform. So think about the Supreme Court by uh, the end of World War II being packed with these New Deal Democrats, these different thinking Democrats. Um, the Republicans had sort of gone out, uh, died off or retired uh, by the end of World War II. Well, these guys are going to start to make these judgments that will be very different than their predecessors. And some of these judgments are going to open up uh, or cause uh, reforms for, for blacks in, in, in uh, not just the South, but the United States in general. So think about this as FDR putting a bunch of guys on the Supreme Court, the Republicans that had opposed him early on in his New Deal, they'd retired or died off by this point. By post-World War II, the guys that FDR puts on and some of the guys that Truman puts on are going to be open to reinterpreting previous laws. So we'll see the Supreme Court start. Some people argue this as legislating from the the bench. And a lot of these judgments, so the Supreme Court uh, tries laws and tries to determine whether they're constitutional or not. And they can essentially strike down laws they determine is constitutional, uh, if they determine they're unconstitutional. All right, so we're going to see the Supreme Court make a series of judgments that will uh, end up being beneficial to uh, African Americans and other minorities. So we're going to talk about a couple of these cases. Uh, one will be something called Sweat v. Painter. All right, so as we mentioned, uh, post World War II, there had been this GI Bill. You started you started to see a number of African Americans. Uh, able to attend college that had never been able to attend college before. Uh, And you started to see this increase in attempts, at least, for blacks to uh, enter college. Well, uh, a lot of the colleges that blacks are able to attend are historically black colleges that have been around since Reconstruction. But there simply aren't nearly as many of these historically black colleges as there are white colleges, again, because there's very few African Americans who can afford to go to college. Well, now you're going to see this uptick post-1946, and this is going to lead to some legal issues. And one legal issue is going to involve this guy right here. His name is Heman Sweat. Heman Sweat. Not Herman Sweat. Heman Sweat, which is a very either cool or weird name. I haven't determined which. So Heman Sweat. So Heman Sweat... Uh, was actually a, a post office worker. He had attended a historically black college. Uh, he'd also worked as in the post office. Uh, but in 1946, Heman Sweat is going to determine that he would like to become a lawyer. So he's from the state of Texas, and he's going to look around, and he determines that there's nowhere in Texas where blacks can attend law school. There's just simply not a black law school in Texas. It, it just doesn't exist. You have some black colleges like Prairie View, uh, but you don't have one uh, that, that's set up to uh, uh, for lawyers. So what Heman Sweat is going to decide to do is try to apply to the University of Texas Law School. Well, the University of Texas is a private, or not a private, it's a public school which means that it receives funding from the state of Texas. The state of Texas uh, provides funding for it. And now the national government is going to provide University of Texas with money because uh, with the GI Bill and an increase in enrollment, the, the national government had started to give more money to schools to grow their facilities. So hire new faculty. You're going to get a lot of these ex-soldiers coming in, uh, and you're going to need new dorms, that type of thing. So the University of Texas receives money from the state government and receives money now from the national government. Well, 1946, Heman Sweat tries to apply, uh, and he's qualified. He, again, uh, went to a historically black college, did exceptional there, and, you know, by university standards, he should be able to get into UT Law School. 
but UT is segregated. The University of Texas had determined we're only allow, allowing whites to attend our school. So when Heman Sweat applies in 1946, UT Law School will reject him on the basis of his race. Well, Heman Sweat's going to see this, and he's going to look around and say, all right, well, you're receiving funding from the state government, federal government. The 14th Amendment says that the national government, state government, can't deny uh, edu- can't deny services based on race. Is equal protection under the law. So he's going to sur- uh, sue the University of Texas, basically saying that you're violating my 14th Amendment rights because you're essentially, a, by taking money from the state and federal government, you're a branch of the government, and you're denying me my rights to get this legal education. And he's going to point to the fact that there's no other law school in Texas for blacks. So the state of government of Texas is providing funds to the UT Law School, but it's not providing uh, funds for a black law school. So I can't get this because the state isn't providing equal protection under the law. So Heman Sweat will uh, sue the state or sorry, sue UT sc- Law School, and it's going to uh, go to court in this Sweat v. v. Painter. So he goes to court um, in uh, Austin initially, uh, and the initial ruling is going to be in favor of UT Law School, but Heman Sweat will appeal this up to the uh, Texas State Court, so the uh, Texas Supreme Court. Before it gets there, the Texas Supreme Court's going to look at the situation, and it's going to say to UT, this guy's right. So right now there's no legal law school if he went, if the case gets up up here and we hear it, we're going to rule in his favor. So you better set up a separate law school for blacks. So what UT Law School will then do is it will create a separate black law school. And this is going to be called the School of Law of the Texas State University for Negroes. School of Law of the Texas State University for Negroes. And it's going to put it off campus. So uh, it's going to put it off campus. It's going to throw a handful of faculty members there, a couple books there. But it's very obvious that the School of Law of the State, uh, Texas State University for Negroes is not nearly the same facilities, faculty that UT Law School has. But by the time uh, Heman Sweat's case gets up to the Texas Supreme Court, the Texas Supreme Court is going to rule in UT Law School's favor by saying, hey, they are meeting the Equal Protection uh, Clause, and the state of Texas isn't in violation because, look, you do have this option over here, the School of Law of the Texas State University for Negroes. Now we're providing funding to both uh, schools. So basically, uh, they're going to rule in UT Law School's favor and basically say, you do have another option, and the state is providing funds for this schooling. So we're not in violation of the 14th Amendment. Well, Heman Sweat going to look at this newly created school, he's going to look at UT Law School, and he's going to say, this isn't the same thing. He's basically going to say, this is uh, 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 this is not the same facilities, not the same faculty. He's going to then appeal this up to the Supreme Court, and in 1950, the Supreme Co- Court will hear this uh, Sweat v. Painter uh, uh, trial. At this point, uh, Heman Sweat is going to get assistance from the NAACP. So as the NAAC is increasing its membership, they're able to hire lawyers, and these lawyers are going to seek out cases to try to get civil rights reform by uh, by supporting court cases that might strike down certain laws as unconstitutional. So Heman Sweat's going to be defended by some NAACP lawyers, like a guy named Thurgood Marshall we're going to talk about just a second here. And they're going to stand in front of these New Deal Democrats by 1950. Again, most of the Supreme Court's made up of these guys appointed by FDR and Truman. And they're going to look and say, all these guys are lawyers. And the Supreme Court, most of these guys come from schools like Yale, Harvard, these law schools that have a lot of prestige. Well, the uh, NAACP, Human Sweat's lawyers, are going to argue in front of these guys, all right, you guys, you're able to get here because your school carries prestige with it. If somebody attends Harvard Law School, then somebody who sees a certificate from Harvard Law School automatically assumes that this guy who graduated there carries prestige with him because it has this history of of, uh, producing lawyers. Everybody knows the faculty there is good. Everybody knows the books there are great. And so 
just by having this name, it grants a certain prestige to um, to the person receiving this award. Well, uh, NAACP will then point out that UT Law School, this law school has been around for, uh, what, 70, 80 years at this point. It's had uh, a lot of graduates, a lot of uh, prestige to go along with these graduates. Uh, people who have previously graduated there have gone on to be judges, uh, Texas Supreme Court members, that type of thing. And so they're going to say this carries a lot of credo because it has a history. This Texas State, uh, I always forget the name of this, School of Law, the Texas State University for Negroes, does it have this prestige? Does it carry the prestige as uh, Harvard or Yale or, in this case, UT Law School? It doesn't. And they're going to argue that even if the School of Law, the Texas State University for Negroes, had better faculty, better books, which it doesn't, Somebody graduating from there isn't going to have the same opportunity as somebody who graduated from UT Law School because it doesn't carry the prestige. And the NAACP will then argue, because of this, you can't have separate but equal in higher education because how can you have equal when you when uh, universities carry different levels of prestige? So they're going to say that if the state or federal government provides funds to a public school, you can't have... Uh, uh, segregation because separate will never be equal in higher education because higher education degrees carry prestige and so if you segregate you're basically pushing for in inequality in, in that regard so in because UT Law School sets up this separate school it is in violation of the 14th Amendment hopefully that's not too confusing but basically they're arguing higher education separate but equal will never be equal well, the Supreme Court, again, all these judges understand that argument, and they look at it as Joe Schmo Community College or whatever that just starts up, even with better education, better facilities. The degree from there is not going to be equal to a degree from Harvard, and so they're going to say, yes, in the case of higher instant education, separate but equal is not equal. And they're going to order that every university that receives federal or state funding you've got to now uh, get rid of your segregation policies. Now, there'll be some resistance to this, uh, like uh, uh, UNT, I, I looked this up at one point, you know, um, a lot of parents complain when they hear that U, uh, UNT uh, will have to, uh, uh, University of North Texas will have to start allowing uh, black students, the parents will complain. The president looks and he basically says, if we try to segregate, We'll get a black student who will try to get in. He's going to appeal the court. The court's going to rule us uh, that we have to open up because of the sweat via pain of ruling. So that what they'll say to the parents is, hey, we'll try. They'll let the black student sue, and then they're going to immediately desegregate. And with a lot of higher education facilities, a lot of these guys are sort of progressive. Uh, it's not going to be a major issue, although you will see some uh, state institutions uh, such as um, uh, the University of Alabama you know they'll uh, uh, they'll try to 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 say segregated as long as possible, but eventually they're going to get integrated. Uh, so Heman Sweat will uh, be successful, and then uh, University of Texas will get rid of its segregation policy as well as all public institutions in Texas that receive federal and state funding. So here we've got this increase in NAACP membership has enacted change through the court. Another more famous example is going to come along under the um, uh, administration of Dwight D. Eisenhower. So Dwight D. Eisenhower takes over in 1953, again, as this Republican who, for pro-business is his main thing, anti-communism, that's how, what got him elected, and the Republican Party in general, although Eisenhower, again, he's going to have the state highway system, that type of thing, but in general, for smaller government. We're, we're not big on reform. And Eisenhower didn't like legislating from the bench. Now, he's not against civil rights or anything like that, but he didn't think it was the Supreme Court's place to, um, to essentially redo things. He thought that was the legislature and the president's, um, president's job to do that. Well, in this regard, when Dwight D. Eisenhower gets into office, there's going to be a vacancy in the Supreme Court and there needs to be a new chief justice of the Supreme Court. So the guy that's the head of the Supreme Court, there needs to be a new chief justice. Dwight D. Eisenhower had seen what these New Deal Democrats have been doing. 
So when he gets a chance to appoint a justice, he wants to put a guy who's going to be um, essentially small government, stop this legislating from the, bre- the bench. So the guy he's going to appoint is a guy named Earl Warren. And he appoints or- Earl Warren. He had been a judge in California. And Earl Warren had been very uh, strict constructionist, meaning he he basically had uh, uh, interpreted the Constitution very literally. He had not legislated much from the bench, and basically he had stuck by previous rulings. He was very conservative, as far as uh, Eisenhower would say. He's not for this legislating from the b- the bench. So when the Supreme uh, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court comes up, uh, Eisenhower will appoint uh, Earl Warren to, to be, uh, head it. Well, this Warren court is going to immediately start to... Uh, as we're going to see, it's going to be immediately after Earl Warren takes over in 1954. It's immediately going to be tested to see whether Warren will be what Eisenhower thinks and not legislate from the bench, or if it's going to, uh, if he's going to go along with these other New Deal Democrats. Uh, so this test is going to come about as a result of a court case that's going to emerge in uh, uh, Kansas. So basically, what had happened, and we talked about this now, after the Civil War, we had uh, certain states basically require segregation of uh, administration buildings, schools, things like that. Again, you know, separate but equal says this is not a violation of the 14th Amendment as long as they're separate but equal. Again, uh, you know, uh, Sweat v. Painter changed that in the terms of higher education, but as far as high school, elementary school, middle school, that type of thing, you still have segregation. Well, after the success of Sweat B. Painter, the NAACP, again, uh, increased membership, increased dues coming in, is going to determine we need to, sir, we got the higher education thing, but we need to make changes at lower levels as well because black students aren't receiving the same elementary, high school, middle school education as whites. So we need to end segregation in these uh, these other areas as well. So what the NAACP is going to do is it's going to look around to find a test case uh, to challenge segregation at the um, uh, elementary school level or middle school level or uh, primary school level, I guess would be maybe the right term I'm looking for. And they're going to look for a place where they can, again, find a case that they can then uh, appeal up to the Supreme Court to challenge this separate but equal argument that had been uh, put in place in Plessy v. Ferguson. Well, they're going to look around. They're not going to pick anything in this deep south. They're actually going to find a, 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 a case in this Topeka, Kansas. Now, Kansas at this point doesn't have very many African Americans. The handful are there are in uh, the major cities like Topeka. Uh, and, and so you have these small African American communities well, in these handful of locations in Kansas with blacks, there is going to be segregation. It's going to be basically uh, local governments can come up with segregation policies. And uh, in one instance in Topeka, there's a family, uh, this brown family. Um, they live very close to a white school, uh, and their daughter could basically white walk to the white school. It's like two blocks away. But instead, because Topeka um, has segregation policy on the books, the daughter instead has to get on a bus, take uh, this bus 45 minutes away to a black school, and then she gets to attend school and then uh, comes 45 minutes home and uh, and then, you know, basically lose an hour and a half a day when she could just be going to this white school based on this Topeka legislation. Well, you know, uh, NAACP looks around and you you got that story all over the place in the South uh, and all over the place We're in these uh, handful of places outside the South of segregation. So what they're going to do is they're going to find the Brown family. They're going to pick them in particular and actually pick a couple other families that are going to sue on this as well uh, because the Brown family, upstanding citizens, the father, I believe, is a preacher, and they're going to determine um, we would like you to challenge this uh, ruling. We would like you to basically challenge the Topeka School Board to allow your daughter to attend this white school. Uh, so the uh, Brown family will sue the Topeka Board of Education, and we're going to get this Brown v. Board of Education uh, suing the Topeka School Board. It's going to make its way to the uh, Kansas Supreme Court. Kansas Supreme Court will uh, rule that, yes, segregation is legal based on the separate but equal uh, ruling in Plessy v. Ferguson, 
but the NAACP is going to manage to appeal this up to the uh, 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 the Supreme Court, and they're going to bring um, uh, this before uh, Earl Warren. Again, the uh, one of the lawyers the NAACP is going to have argued this case is going to be this guy, Thurgood Marshall. At this point, he's fairly young, uh, this uh, up-and-coming black lawyer. Uh, NAACP had hired him, uh, Sweat v. Painter, a number of other court cases. And they're going to ask him, come up with an argument that would get this very friendly court, again, New Deal Democrats, to say that the Plessy v. Ferguson ruling was wrong. Well, uh uh, Thurgood Marshall will get in front of Earl Warren and the other uh, Supreme Court justices, and he's going to argue that the segregation is in itself a violation of the 14th Amendment. He's going to basically say the entire foundation of the Plessy v. Ferguson argument is flawed, okay, because segregation in itself implies inequality. So if you have segregation and you're taking one group of people, you're keeping them over here, a school, a court building, or whatever, and you keep another building, court, thing, uh, group over here, the act of segregating one group from another implies that one group is superior to another. So segregation in itself implies inequality. So it basically says if the government segregates, it's implying that this group or this group is not equal to the other group. So he's going to say that if the government is segregating, then it's basically going against the mat uh, the heart of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment says you've got equal protection under the law. As long as you are a natural-born United States citizen, you can basically, um, the government's supposed to provide you equally, regardless of your race. But by segregating, that's treating people different, and it's implying inequality. So segregation is uh, uh, inherently unequal. Separate but equal is inherently uh, unequal is his exact wording. Well, the Supreme Court's going to hear this, and a lot of New Deal Democrats, the NAACP is going to assume that they're going to fall behind them. They're not so sure about Earl Warren. But when they hear this argument, the Supreme Court is going to rule in a unanimous decision that in this Brown v. Board of Education, Topeka Board of Education vote, that Marshall and the NAACP is correct, that segregationist policies are inherently unequal and they're a violation of the 14th Amendment. And they're going to rule, and this is going to include Earl Warren, the guy that uh, Eisenhower had put on the, the thing to stop changing from the bench. He goes along with the rest of the justices, and they're going to say that schools must desegregate and this is a quote, with all deliberate speed, with all deliberate speed. So we have in this, this ruling, which was actually uh, 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 called up in 1955, this ruling that uh, separate but equal is inherently unequal. So government facilities need to desegregate as soon as possible. Now, this isn't talking about private restaurants or anything like that. This is talking about courthouses, local governments, city governments, state governments. Uh, you need to put in place, uh, uh, start integrating with all deliberate speed. What does all deliberate speed mean? Well, it can be interpreted a lot of different ways. Some people are going to take it as, you know, right away. And as a matter of fact, uh, Topeka, they do that almost immediately. Topeka says, okay, uh, this it's kind of crazy. Kansas doesn't have very many segregation laws anyway. So Topeka just says, all right, forget it. And they start in integrating almost immediately. It's not a major issue there. Now, in the South, however, where you have this history of this racial animosity, you have this large black population, you have this, uh, again, historical repression that goes before the Civil War, and especially after uh, Reconstruction. All deliberate speed, most of the state governments, local governments, are going to take this as, let's just take our time. And you'll see a lot of cities and states say, all right, we'll just get around to it eventually. All deliberate speed to them is going to mean a couple months away. And this is going to be the case in schools uh, through most of the South, but we're going to see in some cities, some states, 
there's going to be some that move a little bit uh, quicker than others, okay? Uh, one uh, school uh, school board that's going to move a little bit quicker than others is going to be this school in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, okay? So the Little Rock School Board is going to take the Supreme Court ruling. And let me just point out, some people are going to ask Eisenhower to enforce this, okay? The Supreme Court says... Um, a rule with all deliberate speed. Supreme Court can't doesn't have an army. It can't uh, force anybody to do anything. Basically, they're expecting the president to do something. But the president, Eisenhower, especially because 55 is an election year or 56 is an election year, he's going to say, all right, all deliberate speed. Everybody s- start to move on it, but he's not going to take any action. So we're going to see a lot of people sort of, you know, uh, uh, shift their feet. They're not going to take a lot of action very quickly. Well, uh, uh, so Eisenhower's not really pushing for this uh, this uh, desegregation to go about. So a lot of states are going to, you know, uh, push this off. A lot of cities are going to push off this desegregation. Well, in 1957, this sort of lack of action is going to come to a head when the Little Rock School Board is going to determine that we need to start the process of integration in in uh, accordance with what the Supreme Court says. Um, this Little Rock School Board will tell this school, Little Rock Central High, it needs to start admitting black students. So in Little Rock, there's the black school. There's uh, actually a couple different white schools. There's uh, Little Rock Central High. Uh, that's the white school. And then again, you have this uh, black school on the other side of town. Well, Little Rock will say, school board will say, all right, let's begin the process of integration. And they're going to say, We'll start this by having nine black students attend Little Little Rock Central High in uh, 1957. So these nine black students are going to show up for class at Little Rock Central High to integrate the school. But when they arrive, they're going to find that a lot of white parents opposed to the idea of their kids going to school with blacks have gathered around side, around the school. And when the black students try to get in, they're essentially going to be blocked by these white parents who are going to refuse to allow them in. Well, you would think that the government would step in and, you know, local government, city government, maybe state government would step in and say, all right, you're preventing these students from coming in. Instead, the governor of Arkansas is going to determine it's the black students trying to get in that are causing this riot, essentially. And he's going to stand in the state militia, uh, call up the National Guard, uh, uh, which governors can do. It's a, a branch of the Army. They call it the National Guard for national emergencies, things like that. And he's going to send the National Guard to come here and essentially prevent the black students from entering the school. So instead of coming here and allowing the students to get through the white mob, the governor will call up the National Guard and say, prevent the black students from coming in, keep this situation uh, uh, quiet, and uh, sort of keep the status quo. The governor's against uh, integration. All right, so he calls up the National Guard. Now you have this branch of the military. So this is actually under Dwight Eisenhower. As president, you're uh, head of, your commander-in-chief, which means you're head of the military. Now your military is used to is being used to keep segregation in place. Well, Eisenhower, again, he had not been calling for any action. He didn't like the fact that the that uh, well, I shouldn't say he didn't like. He didn't like that the uh, the Supreme Court had ruled on what it ruled with uh, uh, Brown v. Board of Education because he didn't like that much change. But now that it's made this change, uh, and again, he hadn't done anything to enforce it. But essentially, the governor of Arkansas, by using the National Guard, is going to force Dwight D. Eisenhower to take a stand on the issue because he's using his military to uh, enforce uh, this segregation. Well, Eisenhower's going to say, fine, I've got to I've got to step in. I've got to make a decision on this. He's going to call up the National Guard, the uh, head of the National uh, Guard unit, and he's going to say, don't listen to the governor anymore. I'm the president. I'm the boss. Call up your troops. You guys are done. Just go home. I've got the situation handled. And this is essentially going to force his hand because what he's going to then do is send the 101st Airborne. So this is the same unit that had 
if you ever watch the show Band of Brothers, it, it, it talks about these guys. This is the same unit that had uh, parachuted behind uh, uh, Nazi Germany lines in uh, World War II in preparation for D-Day. Uh, they fought all the way until Germany, uh, who had you know had this uh, tremendous military experiences during World War II. That was just 10, 12 uh, years before. Now he's going to call up this same group of elites to escort these black kids to class. So Eisenhower had essentially been saying, you guys handle this, but this forces his hand, and we're going to have the 101st Airborne now escorting these, these uh, black students to class. Uh, this is sort of going to set the precedent for other schools. Uh, start desegregating. If you, governor, try to defy this, then we're going to call in the national military to uh, uh, enforce integration. So from this point forward, we're going to start seeing integration of schools. And again, this is going to mean that uh, uh, blacks will get uh, the same education as whites uh, in most instances, I should say, because there will start to be on the local level. If we can't discriminate based on race, you'll start to see a lot of local districts redraw school lines and then make, you know, this area of town with a predominant black population. This is uh, one school. This area of town, we're not doing it based on race, but we'll do it based on these weirdly drawn, drawn school lines. This part will be the white part of town, this part black part of town. So you'll see a lot of instances of that, but a lot of school districts will start the process of integration uh, as, as a result of this Brown v, uh, uh, School Board, uh, Brown v. Board of Education and this, what happens in 1957 in uh, Little Rock. All right, so you start to see this major reform, but a lot of people in the NAAC in particular are going to say, this is only, we can only go so far uh, with Supreme Court rulings. We actually need major legislative changes, but the problem is you can't get major legislative changes because a significant portion of the black population is disenfranchised. In the South, sure, we're uh, going to be getting uh, education at a better rate because of the integration of schools, but you still uh, are having an economic disparity. There's still poll taxes in place. Uh, you're still having this education disparity, at least for uh, the current generation and, and uh, nearby future generations. So we're not going to be able to get around uh, literacy tests um, uh, to, to see achieve the same enfranchisement levels. You got other forms of disenfranchisement. Bosses simply won't allow black workers off on on voting days. So how are we supposed to get legislative change? What do we need to make the education and economic reforms to bring uh, blacks up to e equality if we can't get people in office? So what you're going to see is this in the late 1950s is the NAACP is going to start this movement to essentially try to get legislative change by grabbing the lapels of the people in the north and the west. Now they understand that in the south they're not going to be able to get anybody to go on their side because white southern democrats dominate politics there. Again, blacks are disenfranchised in the south. So what you're going to see is the NAACP start to basically focus on whites in the north and the west and basically try to get them to see what's happening in the south with blacks in the south to enact legislative change from at the outside. So how do we show the plight of African Americans in the South to people outside of the South? Well, the NAACP is going to uh, do this a number of different ways, and there's going to be a number of different NAACP leaders that will push for this uh, uh, legislative change. The one we're going to talk about and the one that's earned the most prominence is a uh, uh, NAACP uh, leader, civil rights reformer. It's a guy named uh, Martin Luther King Jr. So MLK... Uh, same story as we've talked about with uh, guys like uh, you know Edison Ford, things like that. Same background, uh, voracious leader, incredibly intelligent, uh, very you know uh, good in school. Although some of those guys weren't necessarily good at school, but um, uh, MLK skips two grades in high school. He's going to receive his first bachelor degree at 19, second at 21. Um, he's going to earn a doctorate uh, at the age of 25. The thing that's going to make MLK, though, I mean, you do have a number of educated blacks in civil rights positions that before him, but they're not going to earn the prestige he is because, the, well, the reason I think MLK is going to become big is because he's also going to be an ordained minister. Why is this important? Well, you got to think about the 1950s, 
there's other stuff going on. In particular, the United States is focused on the Soviet Union and these godless commies. And a lot of people are going to start associating social reform with communism. Again, Soviet Union, at least in, in thought, would be everybody's equal. You know, there are no classes. You have this communal society. So if somebody starts talking about social reform, a lot of people will be quick to point out, that guy's a godless commie. He's probably in bed with the Soviets. Well, it's going to be hard to do that if somebody's an ordained minister, preacher, and is constantly using biblical allegory in their speech, which MLK will do. He's going to start saying, we need reforms for blacks. Uh, we need civil rights legislation because that's what Christ would do. This is the Christian thing to do. And this is going to be important because this is going to allow him to separate the civil rights movement from uh, the communism or from uh, any thoughts of communism. Although some will certainly uh, associate and think King is in, in league with the Soviets, uh, most will be able to take this Christian allegory and say he's obviously um, uh, not a member of this. So uh, MLK is going to come on the scene in 1955. Uh, with this Montgomery bus boycotts. We won't talk about this. Uh, I think a lot of people have heard about it before. But basically it's a, a boycott against uh, the Montgomery school bus system. Um, so this starts in uh, uh, 1955, and this is going to force the desegregation of the uh, Montgomery uh, city buses. Uh, but MLK is going to go beyond this. You know, all right, bus boycotts can only get us so far he and the NAACP is going to say, in order to get this major change, we've got to get people to pay attention to what's happening in the South. And not just what cities and state governments are doing, but what is happening in average Joe Schmo store, things like that. So what MLK and civil rights for leaders will start to do is they're going to start this form of nonviolent protest. Their hopes are to use this new media, particularly television, to show people this is what happens, uh, this is what happens to blacks in the South. And so they don't want to use violence because they know if they use violence, then people would say, okay, these are commies, these are guys that are trying to start a revolution against the United States. That's going to be ineffective. So what MLK and, and the NAACP and other uh, black or organizations will start to do is we want to show ourselves in the best light possible, and we kind of want to show them in the worst light possible because we want them to get on our side in legislation. Now, some people think of this civil rights movement as sort of this kumbaya, you know, this great thing that, uh, uh, you know, is, you know, is, uh, how should I put this, uh, that's, you know, simplistic. That's not the case at all. What this is going to be is this complex strategy to use media to win over the hearts and minds of people in the North and the West. It's basically taking a new medium. It'd be like today, somebody using Facebook or Twitter or something to affect politics. And this is going to be used to, again, uh, win the attention, win uh, public perception uh, towards applied blacks in the South. And again, a lot of whites outside of the South don't know what the situation is. It's simply that's another world down there. Uh, and any any uh, attention that... that, that uh, uh, or any information you get, you know, that's sort of, that's going on somewhere else. So like today, there's still slavery in Maritania in Africa today. It's pretty prominent, but we don't pay attention over here. Nobody pays attention to it because we don't see images from it. Well, what MLK is going to be doing is I want to bring attention to this civil rights violations in the South. I want to force people to pay attention to it. So again, today it'd be somebody like using a Twitter campaign or something or Facebook campaign to get images of, uh, uh, it, of, of things that are going on uh, in, in certain countries in Africa to, to show that uh, uh, show that the, the stuff that's going on over there. All right, so how can we do this? How can we get uh, people to pay attention? Well, what we'll see is MLK will and the NAACP will organize things like sit-ins. So there are uh, in the South, throughout the South, white-owned businesses that won't allow blacks to eat in the dining room, and this is the majority of them, uh, with whites, you, so you either don't eat in the restaurant or you got to eat in the kitchen. All right, well, MLK and NAACP is going to say, we don't care if it's just mom and pop owning a store. One store, not a big deal. 
what if we have something that is a major corporation, something that where they own uh, stores not just in the South, but outside of the South? So what they're going to do is organize sit-ins in places like Woolworths. So Wool Woolworths is a department store. You know, they sell all sorts of things, tools, clothes, that type of thing. But they also have lunch counters where people, as they're shopping, can get something to eat. So think Ikea or something today. They have the little meatball counter or whatever. So what we want to do is we want to basically get people to force, force Woolworths to be... Um, and its segregationist policies. So what they'll do is they'll get some nonviolent black protesters. They'll go to Woolworths in a southern uh, city. Now the Woolworths, I should say, in the north and the west, they're desegregated. There's not any issues. You know, if you're black, white, you can go up to it. But in the south, they're segregated because that's sort of the uh, what other stores are doing. So you go sit at this counter, and then you just sort of wait to see what happens. And I shouldn't say wait. You call up the media people with cameras, these new uh, video cameras that can uh, show this stuff on TV, and you see what happens. Well, a lot of times what's going to happen is what we see here. Uh, whites will say, hey, you're not supposed to be here. The owner's going to say, you're not supposed to be here. you got to leave. Well, uh, MLK and, and NAACP is going to say, don't go anywhere. So you'll just sit here, and one of two things is going to happen. Uh, local police will come in and arrest you. All you got to do, don't fight them. Just get show yourself getting dragged out. And so camera's going to be picking up somebody getting dragged out of a Woolworths uh, in, in this sort of horrible scene uh, uh, there. Or you're going to have these guys, guys like this, come around, and they'll do things like uh, pour shakes on their head, pour sugar on them. I had a different picture before uh, of all this stuff. This also gets shown on a camera. And now you're going to get people in the north and west that go to Woolworths, and they're going to say, what the hell's happened in your stores? Why is this kid getting crap thrown on his head? You need to stop this. Uh, why are you arresting people for just sitting at your lunch counters there? So they're going to organize these sit-ins of major uh, corporations. And this is going to get a lot of these major corporations, particularly this is going to be uh, early 1960s. Uh, we'll see they'll reverse their segregationist policies. Okay. All right. So uh, sit-ins will be one tactic used by the NAACP. Another thing is going to be protests. All right. So, if we want to get attention of uh, voters in the North and the West, uh, the situation in the South, we've got to show that the African-American community is upset. Now, there's some people that uh, from the South, Southern politicians say blacks like segregation. They're fine with it. Everything's good. Uh, don't worry about it. Well, in order for civil rights organizers, they have to basically show that's not the case. We stand together. We're united against it. But the problem with that is that a lot of uh, businesses will say to their black workers, white-owned businesses in the South, if I see you protesting, you're fired. Um, or you'll have people uh, scared of the reaction of uh, police or something if they go out to protest. So what uh, civil rights organizers will do is they're going to try to set up protests that will get people to attend um, uh, in, in spite of themselves. That might be the right way to do it. So let's say, and this is going to happen a couple times, NAACP, MLK, so it's a pr protest, fearing that they're going to lose their job, uh, black protesters simply won't show up. So they organize a protest, hoping to get 5,000 people. They only get 400. Well, you don't want the media to see that because, again, Southern politicians can say, look, this is... Uh, uh, they're not they're happy with segregation because look how many people attended. So what the NAACP will do is pretty creative things like, all right, let's hold the protest outside of the factory where a lot of black factory workers are. And let's just have it to where protesters meet here. And then as the black factory workers come out, we'll have thousands of workers coming out. And then we'll get these photographs showing thousands of people in attendance. And then this is going to be shown in newspapers in the north and west. Okay, well, now it looks like, hey, a lot more people are organized around this. Incredibly creative. Another way um, to get these protests uh, effective is uh, MLK is going to say, all right, well, the, all right, sure, this will bring a little bit of attention, but it's not showing a lot of the negative. It's showing people united and people can come back and say, oh, well, see, they're able to protest in peace. Everything's fine down there. So what the civil rights uh, organizations will start to do is try to find places where protests are going to be met with violence. Uh, for, for example, uh, MLK tries to organize a series of protests in Atlanta 
what happens in Atlanta is the police commissioner is, I don't want to say a friendly guy, but he's not a violent guy. So what happens is when he sees his protest um, and you'll have MLK set up a lot of times these protests and they will be uh, minor violations of laws like organized, uh, they don't receive a proper permit. And so the uh, uh, the, the uh, police will be sent out. And what MLK and civil rights organizers want is a negative reaction because they want that to be on televisions in the North and West. But what happens in Atlanta is the guy says, okay, well, uh, I, I know that's what they want. So instead, he just re- uh, arrests the main organizers and sort of lets the protest disperse. Well, that's not what you want if you want to get attention. What you want is what happens in places like Birmingham. So what? because there's not a big reaction to what happens in Atlanta, because there's nothing that grabs people's attention, what we'll see MLK and civil rights organizers do is go to a place like Birmingham. Birmingham has this police commissioner that's it's just stupid. He's 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 reactionary. He uses violence. He reacts to things violently. So what they'll do is they'll organize protests in places like Birmingham, knowing that the police are going to react to these things with violence. So you'll have a protest there, and the police will say dispersed. All right, we're not going to disperse. We're not going to be violent, but we're going to just sort of stand our ground. Well, then the police will come in with fire hoses. They'll unleash dogs. They'll um, uh, hit protesters with batons, that type of thing. That then is going to be shown on TVs and newspapers in the North, and that's going to start bringing people's attention to the plight in the South. That's the stuff that human beings react to. They don't react to, again, uh, peaceful protests in a lot of instances. So MLK starts these various protests, but the problem is still that in spite of this, you're getting attention And you're getting more and more people on board with the idea of legislative reform. But MLK still needs an ally. He still needs somebody to sort of drive uh, this legislation through. Well, in 1960, MLK thinks and the various civil rights leaders are going to think they have an important ally in this Democrat that's going to run for president, uh, the presidency in 1960, a guy named John F. Kennedy. We'll talk about him next time.